Welcome back to Surreal Physics, where we're taking another look at the math of the universe. This episode's a bit different. It's feature length, overviewing how games and their surreal numbers help us rethink physics from the ground up. We'll get into the relativistic form of time found in surreal exchanges in more detail than before. This foundation allows us to gist how energy emerges from a surreal notice theorem, suggesting something around mass in a playful Lagrangian. Though with so much to cover here in too. Many details will have to follow. That said, most of current physics can be playfully embraced, but the significant interpretive twist revealed a third in here gives us some fun new thought experiments to play through for what we call fields and their particles. And then of course there is a whole second part to episode two, including applicable experiments, historical context, and more on the difference games make in light of strings, loops, more abstract graphs, and other alternative foundations. This early podcast version is actually a preprint of sorts. If you make any comments below that allow me to correct or otherwise improve the final rendered version that I'm animating, then I'll acknowledge your help at the end of that video, along with the disclaimer you don't necessarily endorse any of its speculations. I won't believe any myself ahead of sufficient experimental evidence. Papers with even more details will be linked below. And as always, thanks. Thanks. Uh, but Surreal Physics, episode two before episode one. Can't you count, you might be asking, while also remembering episode I was supposed to be next, with those division algebras teasing us from the beginning. Where are all the funny quaternions, the strange octonians, and what about our patience? It's just too much. Well, my friend, I'll say, I really want to get to episode I too, and I have faith in you and your patience. Like anything with a modicum of free will, in the midst of many simultaneous moves, I'm choosing otherwise at game time. Actually, the surreal twist of this episode dawned on me before the further twisting significance of I, so more reflection figured two really must come first in our story, in more ways than one. But it's complex, and we are making our way around to those so-called imaginaries in partial order. To break a little of this suspense, we'll begin to scratch the beautiful surfaces of the higher composition algebras in the second half of this episode. Finally, as with so many games playing out across the universe, it seems some have more ways they could play out than others. So how might we tell these games apart? Name them. How picky is the universe about its games, or does anything go? What's possible? Necessary? How ignorant could we be of games we don't play? can't play. For games we do play, how differently do we pick our options from any other players out there? All those frames of reference. What precisely is a frame of reference, including ours? Maybe math can help, and our trusty pal experiment, or at least give us hints as to whether these are even fruitful questions to be asking. My hunch is we don't ask fun questions like these seriously enough. The standard math tools of modern physics leave little room for anything other than a strange paradoxical mix of determinism and stochasticity at its base. Perfect descriptions of unexplained values, as far as they are random. But do we just throw up our hands with anthropics and these effective yet ultimately inconsistent theories? The standard math we use to understand the decisions we make day to day hide any freedoms and dice and the experimenting scientists themselves. But people still turn around and say that science suggests our experience of choice is completely illusory or that it doesn't matter. Yet, if we want to better understand whatever freedoms we may have, perhaps limited and imperfect, and all we do think and build, how surely can progress come when the math we choose to model physical reality leaves no room for determining choices in time? Remember what a game is, at least two sets, often labeled left and right, composed as one player meets another, showing which states either can move to in a generalized tango, a conversation, including the possibility there are no moves available, which ends the game. At their simplest, games are the minimal informatics of exchange by at least two frames of reference or more, but at least two frames. Kim Weston and Marvin Gaye were right. It takes two, maybe me and you, left and right, or is it right and left? Oh, and uh, Rob Bass and DJ Easy Rock too. It takes two to make a thing go left, up, uh, or right. That uh, L side and out of sight, surreal B side. Anyway, these are frames which normalize each other, 
meaning they bestow their units of measure in mutual relating to one another. From this, watch the values and symmetries flow. Of all possible games, some special ones keep emerging with values we call numbers, otherwise known as the surreal numbers. Fittingly, as what looks like the real numbers fit completely inside their boundless yet ordered fringe of measures. Their infinite values, more like endless conversations around a shared ideal form than completable realities, actually find a remarkably common definition with the rational dyads of finite construction accounting altogether for the totally ordered games. These surreal numbers are a proper class, which is a polite way of saying they bust open the idea of a set while offering two olive branches back to them, but again, at least two. To remind you of the formal definition, a game is a number when the left set's options are not greater than or equal to the right's options, according to our inducted in the self-consistent definition of greater than and its negation. Relaxing this rule of order, so to speak, brings the rest of the games into view, where players' options may relate in any way constructible, taking us far beyond the numeric dimension of sequences. We have only begun to delve into the remarkable expressiveness of games across our previous episodes in the Surreal Primer. The most counterpointable point to underscore here and now, in more detail than before, is how games reveal time, or what Conway called birthdays, perhaps with a wink. Options for players build inductively, starting with nothing, meaning the first game we may compose for any natural and coherent sequence of play gives each player the empty set for options, known as the zero game or the origin. The same empty game becomes the end game once play begins. But before we start playing this particular game out, which as a clock will end as soon as it begins and immediately evaporate as a coherent exchange, we can rather build a menagerie of natural sequencing from zero instead, building up new games inductively, not just of numbers, but it will take some time to introduce all the ways we might do this. Most simply and numerically, we can build one from zero, two from one, and so on, as well as as their mirrors, negative one from zero, negative two from negative one, and so on. These natural sequences of whole numbers make particularly special subclasses of surreals that you may already recognize as ordinals. Here, rather generalized beyond Cantor's one set construction into sides. Conventionally, the moves the left player makes are defined as positive and rights as negative, and thus, as we naturally count in the positive sense, the left identity becomes the conventional default, but we must never forget this choice. Positive could just as easily been defined as the player's direction that we note right of the combinatorial constructions slash. If you haven't been already chewing a bit on the formal business of games and their notation, I'm sure this all sounds rather confusing, so let's walk these concepts out for good measure and some examples. Zooming into a particularly critical element of the ordinal sequence of numbers, if left has the game zero as an option to play to, and right has no options, then this defines the game one. Left alone can move in this game in one and only one move, after which the players find themselves at the zero game both out of options. As a number game, one is an element of no, which is the blackboard shorthand Conway gave the surreal numbers. In particular, we write one as zero slash empty set or nothing within the familiar curly brackets. Note too that the game one was built in one step of what we'll keep referring to as time. Inducting from the game's origin at zero, or what Conway calls day zero, we say the game one is born on day one. So to write its birthday in the same surreal notation is to write the ordinal zero slash empty set. Familiar, huh? Indeed, the ordinals are a simplest kind of subclass of no, and up to the first infinite ordinal simply look like the natural numbers counting up positively from zero, where right always has the empty set for options. And wouldn't you guess, the cute blackboard shorthand Conway gave the ordinals is on. With such a simple example, however, it's hard to disentangle any sense of space from time, as good old one has its structure built up or played out. One's birthday is one and the same as its value. So let's now rather look at a slightly more complicated game with a negative value, first observing a preliminary construction where left has no options, but right has the option to move to zero and end the game. As you'd expect, this defines a negative one, mirroring the composition of positive one, swapping left for right. 
right. Now we'll compose a new game from this negative one by making it left's sole option. Meaning if left moves first, what plays out is a tit for tat, or rather a after you please. But what's right of the slash in this new composition? A zero, meaning if right moves first, they'll immediately move to the end game no civilities, and left won't get a chance to move at all. The game negative one slash zero has the value negative one half. No matter if left or right begins play, right will move last, at least canonically. That makes this game negative and a number. As you recall the definition that left's options are not greater than or equal to right's for numeric games. The primer goes through all the reasons why right has a specific advantage of half a unit in this game to bear its value out. But because negative one half takes at least two steps of game making to construct in the first place. No matter if it takes one or two steps of game play sequence to end, we say this game is born on day two, a count written as one slash nothing and an element of on. Well, that's if we're counting birthdays as left does by default. Say we want to count as right would instead. That puts the count tracking structure into the set right of the slash of this game sequence's clock with the empty set always on the left. This construction mirrors on, but of course we call it negative on. These isomorphic counts riddle the values of games as a spine as much as a shadow and as a choice and how to count the constructive steps for any game sequence built. Not cleanly geometric or algebraic, but as something even deeper, rather intrinsic to any form we build. They are defined directionally by one player's frame of reference in relation to the other and are thus relativistically established by mutual recognition of the shared structural origin of play, a zero which eventually becomes the end of the playful relationship of the players. And there is a third way to recognize time in addition to on and its negative. We can track steps both away from the origin and towards the end game in a sense that abolishes partisan preference between players' directions altogether. Thus, we can melt away any meaning of positive and negative in our temporal counts. All it takes is a mirrored composition reflecting the same structures across each side of the combinatorial constructions slash and what Conway calls on to. Also a proper class like no, but mindful of our definition of order, these games are clearly not numbers. They do compose a beautiful algebraically closed field of characteristic two, balancing to zero when we add like structures with like and winding curiously in its values as we count out from and into the ends of games. In the primer, we introduce these values as as numbers, the first of which, star, is written zero slash zero, which like one or negative one can be inductively captured and recaptured to build the sequence. And on two, star can be mirrored on each side, on and on. And as an alternative kind of unit, star will continue to bring us key structural insights missing from our standard counting practices. Thus, in addition to the neutral construction of on two, each player automatically defines their own natural way to mark steps from a game's structural origin their natural count away from zero, the direction of which naturally emerges as the players mutually relate their options with a consistent definition of order, reinforced once the gravitational pull of play begins. Play that will ultimately reduce away whatever structure has been built up at the start of the game, say as the game three naturally plays to two, to one, to zero. A coherent sequence of play, exchanging one game naturally for another from its player's options until the optionless end game is reached. The same ordinal measure of steps building up a game sequence may turn around to count turns of exchange between players down to its end. But the construction and play out of games is not necessarily a symmetric process in these measured steps of time. Options may be hierarchically reduced, leaving no true choice in play as the canonical sequence 3, 2, 1 reveals. But it could also be the case that all options intermediate to zero may be displayed in full for a player, meaning they may jump from three to zero in one turn. In such games, a player may bypass all positions that were necessary to the game's construction to still end the game measuring three. But in one count of time, even when it took many steps to construct in the first place. At first, hearing all this may leave you wondering if numbers is a game's unnecessary 
necessarily complicates them. But in addition to all the other structures we get besides the numbers in combinatorial game construction, we get a sense of two valuedness in any construction, even in the simplest number game. We have not only its value, but its birthday. The latter read from any one of at least three forms of ordinal clocks of our choosing, if we somehow have the means to track or infer such a structural hint for our play. It nevertheless remains a mathematical fact for any construction, but furthermore, a natural abstractive sense of information emerges, such as what precise values and birthdays are invariant in an exchange, and something akin to energy inextricable with what we are calling time. And none of this is apparent in the standard, unplayful construction of real numbers in ubiquitous scientific use. Regarding energy, any given endgame is an inevitable destination for what we could see as a kinetic playdown of time. But the same representation of an end can become an origin again in a new game as potential time energetically builds back up but only in a new game's construction, and thus a new clock getting wound up, so to speak. Yes, the often overly complicated concept of a Lagrangian in physics can be connected to a kind of balancing of game energy. If we balance the play out of games to their setup in an energetically closed system, we have essentially recognized a Lagrangian game of games. Kinetic energy becomes potential energy and vice versa. Here we might see new ways to understand the relationship between time, energy, and information. So the question is, how might the universe do this, if this is at all like what the universe does? Emmy Noether gave us some good hints here. So let's keep the concept of symmetry in mind as we go, and it doesn't have to be perfect in the eye of any beholder to do some good work. Indeed, the quantum continuity that emerges from sequences of games might bring additional dimensions to what Noether taught us more clearly than ever, that energy is the quantity conserved under time invariance symmetry, meaning energy accounts for what does not change when time clicks away across and through a coherent, sequenced system of exchange. Thus, as we discover games arising naturally in the physical universe, including their natural sequences that build up from and play back out to nothing, we will note in particular what of them are invariants, what will not change no matter which player's hat we wear to measure the game's value or its clockable sequential flow. We will return again and again to the threefold choice of clocks to track such sequences and on, negative on, and on too, all isomorphic to each other, but each offering unique properties to count structural steps. With any of these clocks, the same unital march from the general ordinal alpha down to zero can actually track an exponentially explosive gamut of games, the spine of playful complexity in time does not uniquely determine what game we see built. Far from it. The unital march rather unites brawling sequences of playful possibilities as they form and then collapse. How? Well, operationally, the games, including their clocks, can coherently add in sums, sums which sometimes reduce into a single new and measurable value, as numbers do. But generally, the sums of games have multiple irreducible components, like a basis. But this is no bland linear vector space. Game space is rather riddled with gorgeous curving forms and folds, natural groups of symmetries, and these isomorphic clicks of time. Although we can map game space over to the rather streamlined spaces of convention as a bridge to all we've learned in Hilbert spaces and matrices by imposing one group or three to make them physically interesting. In another sense, we may have been doing physics with our hands tied behind our backs, even with the tools we were sure were the most powerful. And to squeeze in a few more bajargon teasers to more fully explain in time. Jargon you could look up in the meantime. In the sums of games, components settle into certain kinds of dimensions, reminiscent of concepts bearing names like Clifford and Grossman, but with the threefold measure of time shared amongst them, 
Time is what ultimately unites the coherent sum of games. Through invariance of their measure, we will find conservation in game energy. But again, steps to build don't necessarily count turns to zero. The smoothing effect of composing alternative futures in a game, what we might otherwise recognize as a superposition, includes a weighing of left's first options against right's. And always, another game could exist with left's options swapped for rights and evenly mirrored constructions besides. Ultimately, these characteristics conspire to make the symmetries of games abelian or commutative, even if the playdown of any given game is a lopsided affair, generally undetermined prior to the choices of play, where changing the order of choices in play can certainly change the sequence of games followed. Game space is open to some very interesting, very non-abelian and non-associative mappings across their fullest operatory extent. Yes, a game is more than its smoothed form of value, much more than its measurable clocks, even more than its universal embedding universe, a billion in extent. Once in play, a game will reveal a further unique sequence across its prior construction, depending on how players choose from options available, whether or not they consciously choose anything, consciously count turns with any of the isomorphic clocks they may or may not mind, as they may not necessarily have any mind to themselves. Even for the most capable and intelligent of players, cooperating or competing, the empty game solidly holds no moves for either. There it is, yet again, the empty set, somehow reliably ready to lend null options at every game's end to count all those birthdays on. And there for us, always, from the beginning, to ground yet another game's construction from its initializing inductive purity. As if nothing is our most reliable partner in building structure. But really surreal physics, you say? Just get real for a second. You seriously think the empty set plays a role in these most serious of functions, not least of which counting, applied in what some would say is the realest reality of them all, counts of time. How can all form, all structure, all signal spring from the formless, structureless void? What? How can somethingness, anything, come from emptiness? There is nothing to that simplest of games. How could there be when nothing yet supposedly exists? Nothing has no role, let alone multiple roles, according to this nonsensical suggestion of not one but two, or any number of views of the empty set. What could such frames of reference even mean before we have our first number or game, let alone two? Well, I'd actually agree that yes, isolated, this strange logical loop may in the end be a bit too sir something to be real. So hang in there. For these urgent and important questions about nothing, let me bring your attention to the ubiquity of the sense of paradox, that we supposedly observe something from nothing. It is not unique to the surreals or anything specific to our discussion details here, whether we're talking about new or very old ideas. This paradox of something from nothing permeates everything. In philosophies, yes, but also in the bog standard foundation of set theory, number theory, categories, and so pretty much all of math that inductively builds, especially with what we call well-foundedness. Thus, this absurdity is right there in the foundations of canonical theoretical physics, even observational physics, which applies the same numerical objects in groups, tensors, functions, you name it, all to generate and interpret what we measure against in models that assume them all the same. Our vacuum is actually now presumed to be an array of overlapping quantum fields coupling and interacting, perhaps as what is often called the quantum foam, coined by John Wheeler. None of it precisely sounding like nothing, matter and antimatter alike, bubbling in and out of existence. Quantitative descriptions include waves or fluctuations, energetic and dynamic in their supposed nothingness, but as they say, not exactly like those physical ones of water or sound with which you are more familiar. 
rather complex mathematical fluctuations of probability, probabilities of existence itself, invoking a good deal of uncertain and explainable randomness to pop and fizz particles in and out of reality. From or in this elusive space-time base we say is empty, a strange non-substantive substance of a quote-unquote vacuum, which originally meant nothing, now a curving, percolating zero-point energy somethingness of nothing, giving startling experimental success. We'll get back to those suggestive experimental results associated with so-called empty space-time in the second part, but no measured result goes uninterpreted. And what precisely is all that undeniable structured somethingness to all of that nothing, foaming away anyway? We say they are mathematical fields, dancing and coupling, holding densely rich energetics, yes, moving and conserving physical energy, sometimes described with virtual particles, meaning not measurable, but all actually in the end quite necessary to describing physical reality. What do we define as what exists? So is there a substance to empty space-time? Didn't we bend that thing called the ether? Well, every attempt to put all necessary structure onto the particle models themselves, even in dynamic collections, never seems to be enough. As always, I'm assuming some knowledge of particle physics and the standard model, as well as topics in physics and math more generally, all of which already have loads of great introductory or even more advanced material on places like YouTube, textbooks, Wikipedia, and its sources. Because we're all on different parts of our own journeys, I try to write these episodes in a way to give you something different every time you listen, perhaps in between your growing understanding from trusted sources. But throughout all those volumes written on the nature of the universe, you'll notice we find it difficult to escape the weirdness that inevitably flows from our perceptions of nothing. What we have come to know as the weirdness of the quantum world and all those strange fields we've come to mathematically layer into the vacuum complex entities that we say are needed to explain phenomena like electromagnetism, the strong and weak forces alike, fields governing probabilistic existence of everything, characterized by vector spaces, tensors, and scalars in ways we may begin to wonder about more and more. So perhaps these inexplicable paradoxes of undeniable something to the nothing are all telling us something, their chorus not a totally chaotic randomness, something we can very well describe with probabilities, even if we cannot explain the invoked stochasticity or randomness beyond anthropic words. Which kind of feels like giving up, but should we give up when all of these particles from nothing exhibit remarkable predictability? There seems to be only so many possible ways to make structures at the smallest scales of our mathematical descriptions of reality. But whatever is behind their reliable presence of clearly ordered information, its coherence surely is something beyond and despite our ignorance. Yes, physics swirls atop a simple yet philosophical bed, some minimal pragmatic beliefs that tomorrow will come much like today, that there is something shared amongst us that exists rather than nothing, what we call reality, persisting in predictable law-like fashion, whatever that really means. Even if we can't say precisely if a bit of matter will read spin up or spin down when we go to measure it, we are still able to predictably validate the persistent existence of forms we call spinners, some we associate with so-called particles. Endless deja vu flood are detectors. All those photons sent to us by galaxies of atoms billions of years ago from distant places all over the universe all tell us a very coherent story about themselves and their electrons and nuclei as those here in our solar system as those bright here swirling inside your screen and your very fingertips, your cells using the same kinds of patterns to process this curious language of the universe, while broader waves of all very much the same stuff are captured in the curl of your ear 
excited by the dance of our earthly atmosphere, which propagates the forms I clumsily send your way on another wider, simpler layer of information and simpler waveforms of our shared reality of something. Whether we'd call it philosophy or science or math, to include linguistics and computer science. Still, those fundamental paradoxes especially confound us when we try to peek behind the space-time curtain, beguiling us all the more decade after decade of entrenchment under a particularly looming assumption that we are the something in the nothing. All when a massive elephant might be right here in the universal language room, eating a free lunch, and shouldn't all the differently abled people rather pause their very busy work for a time to give the elephant one big unitary embrace? Or is the elephant the room itself ever embracing us, a turbulent swirl of atmosphere constantly entangling us with everything else, but rather non-classically as a quite stiff kind of air, a space-time that can play and thus count? You're more than ready for this first big surreal plot twist now, aren't you? Maybe you recognized it winking from the start. That just maybe we have the physical picture backwards, or inverted is a better word. That we've put our empty label in the wrong place, which is the something, which the nothing. Think about it like this. From episode Noel, were you asking yourself, why does this cheeky empty set keep appearing like something of its own? Shouldn't it be no thing? Well, what does no thing appear like to you? A blank screen, white or black or anything in between? Actually, all of those are very much something too. Everything, anything we can think of can't help but be a kind of something to us, even the vacuum. Since this might have everything to do with what we are, how we work, how our minds work, let's flip the script to see where it takes us. What if the so-called vacuum is the something? And what if all we thought was the stuff in the vacuum is actually the nothing, meaning what we happen to point to when we use that null sign of the empty set, not what we think it means. What actually turns out to be behind it physically is perhaps the opposite of nothing. The idea of the void and the symbol we use to define no thing remains as we keep it defined as such by definition in our minds. But what if every time we think we're pointing to nothing in our math and thus ultimately our physics, we're actually pointing to the substance of the physical universe? And thus, what if all those structures of the standard model from the particle models as mathematical thoughts to what turns out to be physically behind them, the forms that make atoms into cells and to brains and the rest of the organic and inorganic world alike, all the gravitating matter going round and what we have come to think of as the stuff of the universe, all the it's from bits of information, propagating patterns of relationships filtered through those dynamics of the substrate upon which we float. What if they are almost simply the marks and cuts, or orbiting folds, the flapping gaps, and truly empty foaming holes, the tiniest snaps of fluctuations, and the grandest gorgeous undulating waves in the something? Yes, what if all those particles waving hello are the games that space-time is playing with nothing other than itself and its absence, with voided out gaps swirling in relative juxtapositions and all the ways it possibly can, logically, mathematically, Yes, what if the light and other force carriers we've come to think of as strangely wave-like particles are quantized by their medium as propagating, flipping, and flopping exchanges in space-time? persisting to inform in coherent enough sequences of time, occasionally predictable and occasionally so energetically gappy that an inertial whole can persist from their actions in the set of possibilities we have come to know more simply and abstractly as Feynman diagrams. What if all those massive particles, everything making up you and me and galaxies of stars and gas are actually persistent holes? The Higgs field, perhaps more of a holes field, 
Abstracted in modern physics is the breaking of symmetries in the field flows which preserve inertial structures and their dynamics. Perhaps another way to describe this is what it takes to make holes more solidly persist in the universal stuff, which symmetries and the exchanges are necessary to break, suggesting which may further help reinforce a breakage such as what we've come to know and love through observables like charge and spin. Consider the scalar inertia of a hole in a volume whose surface of formation propagates at the speed of light. Patterns swirling and twisting in ways that preserve the hole, a voided formation whose center always moves slower relative to what are otherwise known as the massless particles that propagate in paths around it paths of perhaps varying symmetries. This could suggest why the weak force bosons always carry a sizable mass along for their ride, bringing inertial holes to and from other holes as the most mass sensitive force. Well, besides gravity, but thanks to Einstein, we already suspected that gravity as curvature is no conventional force at all. What if none of them quite are? That forces rather emerge from all possible natural curvatures space-time can make from its gains, including but not limited to numbers of exchange. But it might be the smallest, simplest game space-time can play at those tiniest scales of distinctions, which reveal the shortest meaningful time resolutions for us, real time on relativistic terms, what we otherwise know to be Planck scales. In this picture, we may see no need for a conventional conception of a graviton particle to carry the informatics needed for gravitational exchange. What we may rather simply see as the patchwork of temporal ordinal exchanges of games kinetically striving to their ends. We start with this Lagrangian logic introduced that games can play down and build up all the very useful abstractions of particles along with their formative waves and the rest of the field they supposedly represent excitations of are all seen as rather composed phenomena of one substance alone, a playful space-time forming plays which are not so quantumly weird as particle wave dualities in this picture where the extended structures of space-time and its absence define them. What could this more specifically mean? Let's dip back to the fact that weak bosons have mass and get a little more focus on what the inverted picture might entail. For those that know or want to know more about the standard model, its standard Lagrangian suggests bosons should not have mass. This comes from an assumption from the gauge invariance that the underlying field cannot be zero, forcing the mass of gauge bosons to vanish in order to zero out the problematic term for invariance in the Lagrangian. Why not just give up on gauge invariance? Well, it's been a fundamental lesson hard won through centuries of scientific observation and deep mathematical reflection. Central to it all is again what Emmy Noether taught us as we attempt to capture what symmetrically does not vary as we move around and take different perspectives in a system. She showed us how each invariant symmetry we find tells us about another quantity conserved, now called Noether's theorem. And gauge invariance goes beyond any change of coordinates system. Beyond any particular mathematical formulation of a system's theory, it's so intrinsic to our physical understanding. It tells us why and how we build a Lagrangian in the first place. That said, the exact way we formalize gauge theories today are not beyond revision. You may suspect from our earlier discussion of game time and energy that gauge is something we can naturally glean from the math of games and that a surreal and playful Lagrangian may be right around the corner. Game values can convey a both general and relative sense of invariance when two or more frames of reference meet, showing us what does not change in an exchange, no matter the rules, no matter who moves first, like that smooth value of a superposition of futures and the measure of the tick-tock of a clock, even if precisely how many clicks a game gets in play is unknown when we start, even as rules restrict or bias which values we ultimately see, changing them does not always matter and ultimately there is something much more invariant about an exchange of mutual relation persisting through time and space which defines a value rather than anything external to it or any multiplicity of rule sets that can bring about such values in physics we're used to playing the game of finding which rule sets best matches reality 
But game goggles show a different approach, that values, rather, are what powerfully rule the day, not the endless variation of rules imposed on or layered into a system. Many different combinations of rule sets can give rise to the same values. Numbers are particularly sturdy structures of exchange, particularly predictable values that hold fast in their measure. Say if we add or remove more rules to a game. Usually when we speak of gauge, we evoke symmetric measures born of such sturdy mathematical objects, but the games beckon us to keep our minds open to all that may gauge and variant in a system. In time, you will see the nimber star play a critical role here to somewhat free our hands and stretch us into what is called partial order. Star is actually the first game born as a true superposition of outcomes. Returning for now to understanding massive bosons as observed, we come back to the Lagrangian questioning this assumption that the underlying field cannot vanish, related to the assumption of continuity. Yes, we can pull off some minor miracles with the Higgs mechanism matching up its bosons to create mass out of these weak ones we're talking about. However, if we allow for holes in the underlying mathematical structure of space-time itself, this is technically another way forward, theoretically, and may do a lot for us in the end, as long as we find they are nice and tame, even if removing this assumption literally breaks the all-pervasive continuum's spell. Again, this could be wrong, but what if it's a little less wrong than assuming otherwise? We can immediately see, too, how holes act mathematically similar to what we otherwise name mass. And what is that, again? Anyway, energy over the speed of light squared or something like that. We rarely admit that mass persists as a curious set of mysteries all on its own, as something we get rather comfortable with at a very early age. In a space-time that naturally plays at light speed, any holes would be highly unstable, collapsing at this speed right to their centers without something like a swirling interplay of their medium to preserve their holy structure. If more momentum of play is brought into the swirl looping around the shared endgame than the default collapse to zero, then we see how this angular momentum would appear in a sense as greater than light speed to oversimplify a complex structure. Games help us intuit a more subtle picture of these energetics, but simply, the symmetry-conserving interplay of angular momentum would do a lot to persist holy structure against the beeline rush to the endgame. An energetic swirl that, if disrupted, might otherwise rush to become another origin in a curious kind of anti-time splash. Yeah, we'll get back to that later. The games actually suggest that sequences characterized by angular momentum emerge at a number of distinct levels of value. Some that end up looking like orbital and braidable angular momentum, some that look intrinsic to the whole formation itself, otherwise known as spin, and even these come in a few different flavors of symmetries. The charge of these path-forming exchanges are a related measurable quantity, but distinct from the forms of angular momentum. And you know, observation of the characteristic Higgs particles themselves disappear in less than a zeptosecond after they form. What if these are the fleeting game sequences of the level of angular momentum emerging we call isospin, with no other game sequences of spin or charge playing along to help stabilize it? Perhaps there is a precise way to calculate why this hole would need to be rather large to even come into existence in the first place, similar to other rather unstable games of games that we can only glimpse in fleeting circumstances. Yes, the mass values of standard model particles may be calculable from the composed curving snaps around collections of shared endgames, those which form particularly inertial holes as geometric bubbles of potential held in loopy play, the centers of which are relatively at rest for all the snaps of space-time swirling around them. The integrated mean value of a given void in its relatively resting composed frame may be what we otherwise call its rest mass. These are dimensionless constants as ratios to the Planck mass, which again is measured in energy over squared light speed. These 15 dimensionless mathematical values could simply be multiples and ratios of partitions of space-time, tiled in a sense, around a whole, partitions meaningfully defined by light speed ordinal counts. 
defining time back and forth? Yes? What if we have new ways to renormalize interactions at this scale? And the games even tell us they must be finite. But their quantized shapes may not overall be that new. And luckily, we've been studying the math of shapes for far longer than particle physics. We have learned a thing or two about the shapes it is possible to make in various circumstances of quantified form. The effective surface area of the holes could be supercharged with extra energy, with bells and whistles of extra flips and flops to add to the minimal inertia needed for a restful average of the minimal holes formation. Luckily, we know about some shapes that can do those kinds of things too. As each particle type is meaningfully defined by their different conserved quantities like spin and charge, it makes sense that their rest masses would be different based on how stabilizing such characteristic combinations were and what they ended up forming in composition. We could say the possibilities of evoidance or void production, we can understand geometrically and topologically, would have only so many ways to remain stable for any measurable length of these light speeds exchanges. Other more fleeting swirls are what we might otherwise recognize as the churn of virtual particles, too ephemeral for measurement, too unstable to establish their inertial frame, but contributing overall to the nature of the space-time bulk. Now don't hold back with your skepticism. Putting aside how the heck these holes would even form, you could understandably ask if coherent mathematics even allows for them. Well, if you assume space-time is a continuum, then you've baked some quantum flavored problems right into your initializing definition of space-time. And you know, thankfully, homology and its cousin homotopy, even quantum homotopy, are already established maths. These field study shapes that may have holes, paths that form them, and how one shape may transform into another. And so for some time, topologists, those mathematicians who study shapes, surfaces, or what we could call places, as generally as possible, have been exploring ways to understand the endless smoothness of classically understood forms in rather more quantized ways. In fact, topological quantum field theory is already very much a thing and extremely resonant with this interpretive and version we are playing with. For instance, if we look at topological boundaries, we may see empty holes where there were balls of particles and partitions of substance where we otherwise dubiously quantize the odd field of the topologically interesting vacuum. But jumping into these papers can be like diving into the deepest, darkest seas of mathematics. So let's start simply. We can step back to look at the symmetries staring us in the face from the standard model. They're primarily there because we observed them to be there in the universe in the first place. And looking at them, we see glimmers of other ways beyond the continuum. We can think about important questions like this from the perspective of groups. You may have heard the litany of the standard model symmetry groups as U1 cross SU2 cross SU3, corresponding to the ENM weak and strong forces with their couplings, meaning how they interact and realize or represent these smallest particles altogether. If you like to get really nerdy about physics, you might also have heard that these groups are Lie groups, named after Sophus Lie. Let's start with the simplest U1, which is also called a real Lie group, but it's also equivalent to a certain kind of single value of the complex Lie group known as S1, otherwise known as the circle group. Specifically, these are all the complex numbers of absolute value 1 which can multiply. If you are not fresh on your complex math and all the A plus IB business, it's fine to just think of normalized circles. Now, a given instance of a circle is a continuous symmetry. You swirl it around all day and it looks the same as when you started. But this group is not what is called simply connected, meaning in a topological sense, we have the possibility for holes. A shape with a bunch of holes in it is still connected, but it is not simply connected, meaning you cannot smoothly change any path in it from A to B to get any other path that preserves A and B as path endpoints. Another characteristic of the circle group is described by something from algebraic topology known as its fundamental group, 
which for this group is the additive group of integers. Think of winding around a circle as a count of one. So keep in mind that if you want to multiply winding paths of more than one circle, this is actually equivalent to adding the integer counts of the winding, which can of course be negative. Say going counterclockwise if you started winding clockwise. Kind of sounds like the choice of on or negative on. Winding can go on forever in the circle group. Maybe this is all obvious to you, or maybe it's like hearing strangely elementary concepts in a foreign language, but the circle group is quite literally about very symmetric, connected, but not simply connected loops. We might step further to see these as slices of particularly symmetric holes, or at least paths of play sequences that may be able to swirl holes into existence. A whole collection of them all over the place. Now, regarding the infinitely smooth continuity of a given circle, something we've been harping about for quite a while here, doesn't this pose a problem for our discrete and finite journey? Well, say instead of totally perfect continuum circles, these shapes formed in Planck scale partitions of space-time around, say, some electron-sized hole as tightly packed as possible. That would take quadrillions, if not quintillions, of such partitions, so maybe that's close enough for a semblance of the symmetry. If you are someone whose stomach just did a disgusted flip because that's no longer a circle, that's a different group entirely. Let me remind you this fell move actually connects us, as obviously as ever, over to the areas of math bearing the beautiful name of Galois in fascinating and quite appropriate ways. With a circle, we were always in a sense taking the roots of unity to an endless, boundless count. We've actually frozen out a finite sequence of ordinals here to count roots of some Z mod something enormous. But interestingly, we're here finding another sequence of ordinals, a different inner count of them apart from the broader winding of many circles, perhaps with the same choices in comparable clicking types of ons and even on two, but instead their temporal march counts measures within just one wind of a circle. Also, if you happen to have any familiarity with holomorphic transformations, you'll be quick to remind the skeptical of the Riemann mapping theorem, which says if we have a non-intersecting loop closed in the complex plane, not necessarily a smooth and tame one, we can match it to the unit circle and determine this uniquely if we preserve the cyclic order of a few points around the loop. And hey, we might have time for that, but whoa, whoa, wait a second, the skeptical insist. This theorem is for simply connected forms and we just went through the whole point that holes are expressly not trivially connected in this way. In fact, this mapping is for non-empty subsets of the complex plane. And the whole point of this surreal inversion is that holes are empty. Well, my friends, please remain ever skeptical while noting that Riemann mapping extends to the Riemann sphere, not just the complex plane. This makes the outside of a closed loop just as mappable as the inside, say if we're looking at how it projects from one of its sides or the other, as an arena of play of sorts. Actually, the fact that we're working with the proper class of games rather than the lonely sets particularly sturdies our playful take. But even in the classical setting, Roger Penrose artfully teaches us that there is always an inverted form of Riemann mapping, which asserts that the outside of a loop in a complex plane can be mapped to the outside of a unit circle, where uniqueness holds by even just a single specified point on a loop, along with a distant receding view off to infinity. So for the inverted picture, we're not so fussed about what's going on inside the circle, if anything. But notice, too, I haven't explained precisely how we'd open up or push out a hole in an otherwise tightly packed cluster of spatial partitions, wriggling with time, whether in circular paths or something close enough. Although you'll get some good ideas from existing resources on Riemann surfaces and conformal mappings, we're only circling around the point that there is a consistent picture we could draw between the standard model symmetries and potentially ubiquitous holes in spaces. 
time. In fact, what might not be immediately obvious is if we recognize the integrity of circularish shapes in space-time and well-behaved holes, meaning we do this in the right kind of ways to keep the math from blowing up, then it might ultimately save us from what are otherwise more problematic singularities in our physics, the latter being those more metaphorical holes of paradox that tend to annihilate the whole mathematical picture where they arise. Indeed, the games reveal sequences that circularly arc in provably finite ordinal counts, no matter how monstrously far we count them on, where their summed value is still infinitely smaller than any number, even infinitely small numbers. Yes, you heard me right. This is but one of our starry-eyed paths we'll keep pushing on. The vaguest of upshots to take away from all of this for now is that the U1 symmetries of the standard model, the symmetries most cleanly associated with electromagnetism and the forceful patterns of photons, they are the symmetries of circles, complex values of absolute value one that give us paths we can wind around and around on in any number of not necessarily continuously connected instances. Maybe some, not all, not even most, but maybe some could form holes. And our slightly blasphemous modification that we'll have in mind from now on when we talk about circles in the universe is that they're just good enough for Planck partitions, and we'll see what this does for us in the end. They are all part of a greater and fascinating set of conserved values playing into a greater whole. More discussion of the other groups will come. Rather now, let's bring some of these ideas together to play further with a surreal inversion on those massless particles traveling right at the speed of light through space-time's calmest seas. Are they holeless forms on relatively straight paths, but rather those with a spring in their step, a winding game we call the photon? Would this swirling, many-folding dance of space-time create any gap of its own? Meaning, is there a boundary formed from this pattern as it spirals through the arcs of loops or saddles or otherwise near minimal surfaces which escape the mass warming looping rest? We know photons wave that old EB exchange into measurable polarized patterns, propagating amidst what we are now suspecting may be a tense webbing of a playful space time built of suspended reconnections around inertial gaps. By definition, photons would not conform to what's swirls into these massive holes scattered about, but rather their coiling sequences seem to chase something much more distant beyond the observable horizon. But are they just ambient waves bouncing off all those holes? They seem to bounce along as fast as space-time players play. But also remember from your textbooks that photons have a localized momentum as they slam into an electron, say in the famous photoelectric effect, dumping quantized energy into the electron to free it from its bound state. With our something-nothing inversion interpretation, we suspect that the electron is a void, spun out by the wave-like structures of space-time something swirling around it. And so if a photon that is just a wave carries its energy only as a wave, the energy would evenly spread out as it does in our classical picture of waves, like ripples on the surface of water. You always hear this kind of analogy corrected, that rather with photons, waves propagate all through transverse motion perpendicular to the overall path, whereas on the surface of water, waves are an interesting mix of both transverse and longitudinally aligned motion. So to make sense of the quantized momentum we measure from photons and the energetic punch they pack, maybe there is a propagating gap carried by the photon's waveform, perhaps a Planck scale quantum of a gap that flips and flops along by the relative disconnects and connects of space-time partitioning itself. So in a strange way, maybe there is a bit of longitudinal nothing going along for the transverse ride. But as the waveform spreads out, the gap could shuttle seemingly instantly across the coherent space-time pattern. If you could somehow see the gap isolated, it may appear to be non-locally hyper-jumping around. But that's just if we fail to recognize the underlying connective space-time pulling the strings. The gap itself, in a sense, though, localizes the photon's quantum of momentum, even as the space-time game sprawls. And you know, this is pretty much what the well 
Warren equation says about a photon's momentum, that it is equal to Planck's constant over wavelength, and we would perceive this kind of gap packet of energy as a rather strange kind of particle, certainly not behaving like a billiard ball. The sprawling transverse formation in space-time propagating at light speed means the mean of the little gap propagates at light speed too, but also that the extended waveform of play gives space-time an extended set of options for where to dump the little gap of momentum when their game sequence ends. So consider the double slit experiment afresh, where like before you imagine photons passing through slit openings as extended transverse waves, but now also imagine this occurs through the barely elastic loggerheads of winding space-time partitions, allowing for a coiled snapping of minimal Planck scale gaps of momentum in sequences of games correlating between them. Those little voids seeming to jump across the partitions and the waveform which interacts with everything in its sprawling path. This is no classical bucket brigade. Rather, we see a quantum hot potato, emptiness whack-a-mole, informed and reinforced by the twisting and twirling dance of sloshing electric and magnetic patterns, polarized one way or the other, and what we once thought were separate fields, actually all rather particularly resonant, nearly circular modes of playful space-time. Well, at least these are thoughts we are now playing with. These modes ultimately inform where the little voids hit the detector at some distance, where the patterns constructively and destructively interfere across the full waveform. Microscopically, the photon patterns hit electron patterns, or one of your favorite other options from applicable Feynman diagrams. In the case of electrons, the overall interactions of their spins, which form their inertial holes, with the photon's waves of play would depend on exactly how the waveforms come together and align, including their relative orientation and what we call their phase. The photon's waves and even its little gap packet of momentum may twirl into one of the electron swirls, or they might bounce apart. Either way, it will be in a way that's correlated to the waves of games playing out far beyond these local plays. Maybe a photon's gap can dump enough momentum into the surface sequences forming the electron's void to bump it into a more energetic pattern of play, which may or may not not be stable, depending on the other photonic waves bouncing around it. Maybe to you this all sounds like chaos, but I at least find this picture lends many intuitive possibilities to better understand particle interactions, as well as how particles might entangle across the sprawling games of space-time, correlating in all kinds of interesting ways. No hidden variables can be found in the void of true gaps, but space-time's playful waveforms can reach and stretch at light speed to the extent they may, if not disrupted. Actions between space-time partitions become correlated locally between them no faster than the rate of light speed, even in vast fronts of entangling sums of games. Nevertheless, a disruptive cause here can have a real effect over there, either from external disruption or due to a natural end of a game sequence playing some part to the coherency of the rest. With all that's coupled at length, no new information needs propagate faster than the speed of light at that point to see some otherwise spooky effects. Maybe not spooky when we see the ghosts of particles rather as gaps. Then they are quite literally nothing. However, the energetic surfaces of space-time relating in relative partitions as boundaries of something, those are a rather important something. We'll keep getting into what all the nitty gritties of this could be in light of standard model physics and the experimental results we already know. But first, let's keep bringing the wider landscape into focus. We're painting this picture that when waves of a form dominate their holes and propagate in relatively symmetric paths forward, we think of them as massless while holes that take on a playful circular life of their own we see as a particle with rest mass. We need to pull back even further, imagining space-time patterns propagating across a vast universe full of holy mass, and then zoom right back down on a particular photon's path from its frame, with all that vast, whole, full space relatively curving out around all sides of its view ahead, effectively pushing the vector of its path in what we could characterize as minimal. 
integrating all the curvature around us, or rather just what we feel as we traverse it. As a propagated gap snapping onwards through the thick of all this, as a photon, we only have so many options to persist. We can see those ways forward as those that escape the curving inertia of all the surrounding holes, or rather as which can squish through all the holy bubbling universe in our way. If the radius of curvature of a path says something about how quickly space-time sends information along its way, relative to the rest, then there is a dual sense in which a massless path becomes a path of the unfathomable curvature of the whole. But we don't normally think of the speed of light as having something to do with the overall radius of curvature of the universe, what might be given by some global topology, circular or otherwise. But in a more local sense, we do clearly see light lens as it travels around clusters of galaxies and other densely massive regions, displacing and refracting as predicted in the curving space-time of general relativity. More microscopically, we have known that supposed free space has a kind of permittivity or permeability equatable to the speed of light along with Planck's constant, the renormalized electron charge, and the curious fine structure constant, which actually contains all of the others in its dimensionless product of ratios. So we've known for some time free space is ultimately wrapped up not just in grand cosmic curvatures, but also all the little ones as well. Yet there doesn't seem to be much curvature on the grandest scales, not that we can detect with any certainty at least, not in the ways we've dreamed up so far. The cosmic microwave background, which are those oldest photons capturable, tell us the universe looks isotropic, meaning symmetric in all directions, and homogeneous, meaning consistent in its average properties everywhere. And altogether, this means it's not obviously lopsided or interestingly curved or shaped to the extent we can see. Indeed, we have various measures of cosmological curvature, the Planck mission having one of the most accurate recent measurements at 0.0007 plus or minus 0.0019, completely consistent with what is called a flat universe of zero curvature. To some, this is evidence that the universe must be infinite in extent, truly flat and Euclidean, but technically, it could just as well be finite as an extremely, overwhelmingly large torus or Klein bottle or something else that just seems roughly flat within our horizon, but may indeed have a subtle kind of curvature to it, something getting right back around to itself on the largest scales, such as an enormous hypersphere of what is called de Sitter space, at a scale beyond all imagination, with its positive cosmological constant. Locally, it would appear quite flat, as does the surface of the Earth in a limited and lower dimensional microcosmic analogy. This all relates to a big problem in physics that our something space-time inversion has some potential to inform. Big is perhaps an understatement for this problem, just like any attempt to grasp the size of the universe. The zero-point energy of the so-called vacuum is wildly too high as calculated by any and all workable quantum field theories compared to what we measure out in the seemingly flat but expanding universe, otherwise known as the cosmological constant problem. These values are 120 orders of magnitude off. That's some number followed by 120 zeros or other numbers. But there are actually a lot of assumptions being made about the vacuumness of space on both sides of this mismatch. Many already suspect that if this strange flavor of space-time pressure were better understood, it would revolutionize how we calculate physics from the smallest to largest scales not just to understand dark energy, which you've probably heard is our name for what may be accelerating the expansion rate of the universe as observed. What if something innate to space-time is uniformly encouraging a gentle pressure to keep on playing? that even without any local holes zipping around it, there is a light speed curve at the grandest scale 
of the universal substance that tends to see games build back up again after the previous sequences of play collapse to their end games. What coherent ways might we algebraically, geometrically, topologically understand the source of these otherwise quite puzzling observations with all these dimensionless constants of nature, which again, here, we suspect are quite sensibly formed from the most coherent and predictable sequences of games constructible and playable. Their symmetries are a Rosetta Stone to the rest of math, and their categories a higher language. We don't usually think of the fine structure constant or the masses of particles as constants of space-time itself, constants which the speed of light and so-called vacuum invariably play into. Of course, in our inverted picture, the typical vacuum litany means a path relatively free of obscuring holes fizzing around in space-time, but not necessarily its largest scale of curvature, a grandest kind of arching that nothing could escape, setting the cosmic speed limit? Or do those tiniest swirls of space-time partitions ultimately set this limit? Whether or not a Eurobarus is eating its tail here, what we have, beginning with a relativistic approach to measuring numbers themselves, along with their broader class of games, are their simplest natural sequences as the simplest natural paths of space-time play. This significantly narrows options of otherwise blank slates of Hilbert space, the latter requiring rules and forces imposed upon them to do any physics. But games reveal all possible rules that could possibly matter, while providing some unique patterns not found in numbers. Values we otherwise pull out of thin air to generate groups to add to our bland Hilbert spaces and thus inform otherwise overly flexible Lagrangians to give them their predictive powers. The innate structural beauty of numbers as all important game values for prediction when abstracted into multi-dimensional Hilbert spaces, forget the broader network within which they are truly born. Game spaces are a little different than the mathematical tools we usually go to in physics. They are actually more akin to the carved up cohomologies of super Hilbert spaces, but may in the end naturally build the all important structures found in the universe. No infinite abstractions need be implemented. The games naturally build sequences that curve in short, finite time. Hilbert spaces must be curved by yet more infinite mathematics in questionable amounts of time. We can dream up many ways to tame the unstable runaway feedback effects for how mass and energy interact to curve spacetime, which is of course a reason why we need coherent quantum gravity. But mass imagined as a substance in space will continue to make for some conceptual problems, especially in an energetic continuum field where it doesn't. And as an impactful bonus, holes in spacetime offer at least a little more why interpretation to the how of mathematical explanations you normally hear, where you still might be left pondering the behavior of all these paradoxical fields hosting wave-like particle duels that get so excited as to become bound into this mass stuff, but only a very particular set of values. The kind of theories where mass is stuff struggle to understand why fields require these minimum energies to excite mass into existence, otherwise known as the mass gap. But if masses simply come from voids, that could be the beginning of the end of that problem. See, the mass gap is a more abstract kind of gap than the literal gaps of space-time we've been talking about for our interpretive inversion. But the mass gap is the traditional sense of gap you'll hear about in discussions of energy and space-time, or relatedly, what is called a gapped Hamiltonian, where the ground space is separated by a finite energy gap from the first excited state. We're going to need to keep resolving the seeming paradox of finite infinitesimals that the games supposedly offer. For now, we're back to our waving gap of a photon, carried along by the thick of it all. The photon knows not where it's going, as an ephemeral void, rather being snapped along, 
not so much pushed and pulled until it ceases to exist as a photon, say when the energy that formed it swirls into some other playful sequence, including those absorbing, heated stories of holes we'll keep playing with. But holes in what precisely? What does partitions of space-time really mean? If space-time is everything in the end, and of course still consistent with observations, then it would be constituted by a rather rigid substance if we liken its observed behavior to an array of springs. For it to be playing games with itself at some level, it would be constituted by frames of reference that may flow to some degree in order to measure relative structures of itself through a playful partition partitioning down to Planck scales would not be like the aqueous liquids with which we are most familiar. Rather, space-time's rigidity, known from the Newtonian gravity that lives in Poisson's and Einstein's, means it would greatly resist the odd deformation to include hole formation, let alone waves. But once they're in, it will be just as hard to get them out. And if you've heard of LIGO, you know we've seen waves in space-time. So these waves and holes might sensibly be particularly resonant patterns of propagation for space-time partitions, modes that are well enough behaved to get the universe we see. And so if space-time splashes into itself, it would do so rather rigidly, perhaps in not just three, but four, possibly even more, dimensions. Note we are not postulating any separate elements like air against space-time's analogous C. Where further could these ideas born of a grand interpretive inversion take us? Can these pictures really all sensibly hang together to tell one coherent story? Let's see. We're going to keep playing with the thought that space-time is a collective at play, minimally elastic for connections, perhaps uniform in its properties to explain the consistent way it behaves, perhaps partitioning all the way down to Planck scale limits at the speed of light, all still part of the same massive elephant, wiggling and swirling in its gappy pattern sometimes crashing into itself, and sometimes just dancing. And unlike most other approaches to quantizing space-time at the Planck scale, we rather playfully see the substance of space-time as the only true something, rather than the vacuum. We also suspect quantum mechanics are gap mechanics, propagated by non-classical waves of space-time, because space-time plays in numbers and other games, to include that gamut of curving functional sequences, naturally folding and unfolding between the numbers that we're still snuffing out. We are simply so fond of numbers as the easiest structures to find, measure, and predict. Our bodies have evolved to be particularly primed to their usefulness, but listening and looking particularly carefully to our senses, our states of mind, we may make use of games beyond the numbers as well. Though this isn't something we need only speculate upon, it can be tested as well. But first, try this thought on for size. In the simplest foundations, of the math, how were we able to construct every measurable value, starting with two frames of the empty set, if whatever is behind the empty set does not exist? Technically, you're not supposed to be able to do anything with nothing, but this one apophatic rule emerges, meaning we understand it through negation, which helps us distinguish numbers from any other kind of game. But we didn't need to impose the rule to make our predictions. We just had to discover and name it. These negatively defined numerical definitions are, after all, best characterized by their so-called gaps. Really, it's the insatiable gappiness of combinatorial construction that brings a force of somethingness of it all, a tour de infini, more than any given slice or section of a particular number, rational or real, played out in relative perspectives. Conway playfully riffs that if a collection of objects is a proper class, such as the numbers, we we may call it a university, but the collection of gaps is not a legal kind of object in standard set theories, so we may rather call them an impropriety of the gaps. There are many gaps swirling around the numbers, but Conway reminds us that we commit no improprieties when we speak of one at a time. And this, indeed, is much like time, relative, quantized, open time. 
Conway explains how ordinal counts of unbridled on characterize gaps as much as they characterize the birthdays of surreal numbers. Remembering those left-sided on and right-sided negative on constructions, Conway teaches that they are just as much the lower and upper bounds of the empty set, respectively, as subclasses of numbers, and thus as Conway's gaps contain no games. You see, the games teach us that in our normal understanding of how to get reals from rationals, ultimately from ordinals, we might be confusing some of our gaps for numbers, and that this might in turn confuse our efforts to understand physical situations of numbers and their gaps, that perhaps even the idea of infinity only becomes real once we have the gaps in the numeric picture, as Conway named them. But of course, from this episode on, we imagine the numbers as the gaps in space-time and the substance of space-time itself as what Conway called the gaps, a playful space-time twirling us into a lively gamut of games and a dozen echelons of values, many countable with ordinals and infinitesimal compared to the next tranche. The elements of this strange on even serve as powers in a normal form for what Conway called the gaps, where the base of this form Conway denotes with the classic infinity symbol, indicating the gulf between the natural numbers and the mind-boggling subclass of large surreals, the latter being the infinite real extensions named in wild algebraic expressions of omegas, epsilons, and so on, with endless help from on. There is actually an inversion of on and the tiniest kind of gulf and all the gaps between zero and all positive surreal numbers, one we may even come to see reflected in finite physics as well well as their negative polar opposites counted by minus on. When we take a closer look at the non-numeric games that live near zero in particular, we find this to be a deeply rich part of not just the number line, but all of game space. But the boundless structures on all sides of games and their numbers bring us ultimately to face their gaps, what we now invert in terminology in this ontology, where perhaps the true substance of the universe waves hello to us in ordinal glimpses of time. Our comedianly strange as these windows are, we peer out between our numbers, only able to complete the finite ones, but our aspirations are insatiable as we endlessly mark on. The strange and nextness of time on reveals as the far side of our default bias across the partitioning slash of composition, bringing that empty set symbol into the curly brackets yet again, smelling a bit idempotent. Our ontological inversion suggests what peaks from behind that null sign is only what we thought represented the so-called gaps. But even if this inverted interpretation is wrong, surreal construction forces us to confront a truly infinite mystery, pulling our imagination beyond the reach of measure, showing the formal consequences of the maw of next. And this will in no way stop us from inquiring further and sharpening our tools. For all you constructivist math types, the simple inductive nature of surreal construction might have appealed to you, except Conway's approach to their definition relies on negation. Constructivists are most clearly identified by this understandable desire for proofs to show the existence of something, not proof by contradiction or non-existence. Why did Conway define the surreals in this via negativa, this negative way, when you can construct numbers with a definition in a positive sense of mere less than, which works almost as well as the not greater than? There is a problem with how well-defined multiplication is when we see numbers merely with the positive definition as left is less than right, but many still adopt it, hoping the problems will be solved yet. Zero's status as a number in the via positiva is a bit more in question. Can we logically consistently say nothing is definitely less than nothing? That could be a problem. It's safer to say that nothing is not comparable to nothing, no matter in what sense because we are speaking of no plays, no moves, no precise forms in the first place. But here at Surreal Physics, we're twisting everything around and asking what may lie behind the mysterious dynamism 
to the great vacuum we thought was empty. I can only speculate when it comes to the mind of Conway, but what if he at least found intuitive comfort in the apophatic way to define everything given its strange power and just how instrumental the empty set is all along the ordinal path from zero to the mind-bending limitlessness of the infinite constructions conjuring up this proper class and its very improper gaps. It extends far beyond the reals, while still giving the reals their time back. Why else did he name these classes so fittingly? The numbers mark no, their gaps. What we recognize here hides the true substance. Press on with on. This mental move of inverting the old take on something and nothing may take some time to acclimate to. Uh, I still get wrapped around the old axle myself, kind of like trying to tell someone that it's opposite day on opposite day. And playing that game, you kind of think to yourself, if only we could turn back time. What if we can? We have negative on after all. If we cannot escape a left-like identity always facing a right in play and a positive convention for how we count time, then maybe we can imagine being right and imagine how right rolls back the positive potential of our play. How differently would any of this be if our identity was in fact rights all along? Where we play down the structure of a game with our negative point convention. Well, it depends on the values that are in the game and how symmetric they are. There is a very symmetric sense to our imagining an inversion of our identity and how it shows us two senses of time between left and right, even if they compose into a rather symmetric game time for whatever ultimately plays out between them. A kind of count we can't really cleanly say is positive or negative. We keep saying the word imagine here, when this may or may not have anything to do with imaginary numbers, which may not have anything to do with imagination. But wait a minute, what is antimatter again? Think about this, and we'll come back to it. We're not just inspired by the surreal construction of a wild and wonderful empty set. This flip of the typical paradigm is inspired also by the beauty of the topologically resonant union of algebra and geometry will keep surreally unfolding and folding beyond just the surreals. These interplays play quite well with the twisting inversions of signals that reveal a universe of patterns such as electrons and photons. Yes, in a not simply connected universe, its hyper-complex algebras and geometries have always been united long before our mounting proof and human mathematical results. We have a little saison coming in episode I to add an all but unknown alternative surreal formulation to help us with some age-old problems like all those hidden infinities of the continua applied to finite existence everywhere at once and not totally quantized quantum field theory. Oh, and perhaps this will also say something about Cartesian dualism which continues to rear its ugly head that the power of Boolean logic is sourced not in something A and something B, but good old something and not. Speak not, hear not, see not, why not? Well, maybe you already knew you can say a lot with simple NAND gates, the not and logic gate. Perhaps even the universal all, as we canonically say. But remember the NAND starts with two inputs, a very surreal realization, along with our surreal binary relation of greater than or equal to and its negation. And I'll say too, we won't be taking the narrower intersection of algebra and geometry as the end all be all of the all of nothingness burger, or hyperdonut, or surreal space-time focaccia bread. The topological dance of the games beyond the numbers will play significantly here. If we embrace math as the reaching extents of our pining across ephemeral distinctions, we will find comfort in forms that circularly allow us to reliably anchor in homomorphing definitions that merely outline persistent existence. Our paths, marked in the chaotic yet ordered march on, hold fast especially to what we can reliably predict. Here we will sense the timelessness and math as it may count on from anywhere, even if math only exists across some time, rather dependent on it to be implemented into existence. 
These surreal loops are kind of hard to stop once they get going. Maybe at times in your life you found yourself assuming numbers contained a kind of math substance, something that if you thought about it, might have actually seemed a bit strange if you weren't already some sort of self-professed platinist like so many great mathematicians have been. But with this inverted interpretation, we say numbers are not what they are in and of themselves, not even as thoughts. Rather, they are what they operatively do and shape and where they reside, a knotful enumerating substance. Yes, our old empty stage, once defined well enough with that null sign, may in the end be exchanged as the star of the show, or something even more, especially if we as baryonic bodies are ready to see ourselves emptied. Like Galileo and Copernicus before, might we explore what it means to be even more deeply wrong about the centrality of our stuff and what is truly necessary to the big play, as we're understandably poised to do, losing the plot as a sideshow. Wait, we're a sideshow? There's a connotation with the words sideshow and indeed the concept of nothing that we keep playing with, which includes a value judgment not exactly well-founded. You probably know all about how a great deal of effort can go into a proportionally very small reward, which may yet have enormous impact. Please forgive what you may see as grossly inappropriate use of language, but it's hard to guess what the universe's goals might be, and thus guess exactly what's a sideshow as implied. If we are made of the nothing and the something of the universe in the end, this does not mean we are worthless. On the contrary, whether or not the universe has a meta-objective, measurable gaps and holes in the pervasive something may ultimately be the only way anything can find and learn value and come to logically be understood. We already have great evidence that we are in the minority of universal structures, that according to our best and most independent cosmological measures, the baryonic patterns that construct us are the mere five-ish percent of the universe's energy density, patterns giving rise to richly structured hydrogen in the rest of the periodic table. Actually, only a small portion of this matter makes up all the stars of the galaxies and ultimately as us, as planets of life. Even if we live in a typical spot spiral galaxy around an average main sequence star. We are not typical stuff on the whole, and we are certainly not inhabiting a typical planet, even with all that may throttle evolution ruthlessly forward, from cosmological filaments to galaxies to stars to biology or even our mental evolution. Who is to say what the point of it all may be? Well, you can freely try, but surely you've learned by now here in the 21st century that just because something is in the minority does not make it pointless. And before you put yourself back at the center of the universe, remember math teaches us that there can be more than one logically compatible points of centrality to a coherent form. Stepping down from those loftiest values and judgments as humans perceive them and looking rather closer at the simplest mathematical values, this flip of something and nothing bolsters negation as a deeply valid pursuit that proving what cannot exist may even be a more physically affirmative exercise to our own possibly void-like existence. I'll start referring to this inverted paradigm as the NES, as in not empty space-time or other ways to backronym NES as a game interpretation system. Shout out to my fellow 80s babes, clarifying the links of NES to games beyond Conway's apophatic definition of the surreals is something we'll get more and more into, but the vague idea is that the any flavor of space-time plays games, and I for one am not tied to any one particular type of composition NES can stand for. Perhaps we have a naturally effervescent space-time and many more variations to Come. Oh, I'm not pronouncing effervescent strangely, although that's another fitting backronym if we take space-time as a quantum foam. Spin networks and foams are quite NES compatible under a mere interpretive inversion and minor tweaks to the code. Rather, eversion is what we call the act of turning a sphere inside out. To evert a sphere, one is allowed to gingerly pass the surface of the sphere through itself. But the rules are that the folds can't make any cuts, tears, or otherwise sharp 
increases. More specifically, we're trying to avoid infinite local curvature, since truly numerically infinite anythings don't seem isomorphic to the finite implementations we see all over the universe. Note there is a distinct sphere-like shape to the electron, to astonishing accuracy as far as we can tell through our best measures. Or at least there seems to be no perceptible wobble to its spin, no discernible electric dipole moment. But interestingly too, there is more than one way to evert a sphere, which means options and decisions for the mathematician. Well, and who knows what that means for bits of space-time playing around. And of course, any number of other shapes can evert as well, although in the case of spheres, this is highly related to another much more trendy structure you might have heard about called the hop vibration, mapping for instance three spheres onto two spheres along those circles of S1 we were talking about. Here they're called fibers of the vibration. Although a theorem named after Adams showed there are only four distinct generalizations of this kind of mapping. So hold on to that four part thought as it will click into something more in the second half. But the overall suggestion here is that the everting play of games of various geometries and topologies, including shapes and all possible ways, might just be an important part of what space-time constantly quite naturally does. Maybe. NES could also stand for naturally entwining smashes, as in smash products, which are rather fascinating kinds of operations brought about by topological study and very evocative of the standard model symmetries and structures. Smashes are possibly another way to come to understand the kinds of games, sequences, space-time might naturally play. Maybe we don't need super strings in our NES as much as super smash rings and all their siblings, with no unobserved supersymmetric particles necessary to see it all swirl and hang together. Indeed, superspaces and superalgebras are extremely playful structures, being partitions of two or more mathematical entities, and despite the name, they need not create supersymmetries, just supermonoidal compositions, and hey, that's very NES compatible. Let's put these supers into the console and see what happens. Now, Super Smash products aren't really a thing yet, anyway, so take my conflations with many grains of playful salt hopefully still with an open mind to resonances. Remember those all-important objects we were discussing of U1's circle group? Well, we can smash product two of those one spheres together, perhaps as quantized paths of space-time play and what are otherwise known as unit circles. Perhaps, again, a bit more approximatively here, but remember zeta scale resolution is probably pretty darn good. And as a smash, see them ring into a torus with its hole shrinking to just one point. Well, in real topology, that's what you do. But what if in physics, you shrink the hole down to one encircled Planck scale partition of space-time as you can do no better? Either way, all those twisted figure eights that make up the torus start pinching down and the whole shape starts ballooning into an almost normal looking two-sphere, except with what looks kind of like a pole in its parallels, which is where you've done the pinching and tightest partitioning. It seems as though some amount of momentous energy swirls around this pretty stable mapping, which may be held in the potential of any persisting gaps or voids, in a doubly covered path. Well, we already knew this was related to the hop. Is that an electron? Is it just a unit quaternion? Wait a minute, let's come back to this spinning little mystery. I still haven't introduced the quaternions and it's getting rather rude. But to quickly close this loop, the NES is a kind of interpretive platform, so to speak, not itself a single theory or play or any one game of thought experimentation. In what we have discussed thus far alone, you've heard mostly interpretations of mathematical models currently employed in physics and maybe only some hints at new directions. Using the NES, may welcome in a new theory or 10, but just like any ultimate theory, it is itself vulnerable to testing and rigor and indeed needs these to be taken seriously. A great question is why jump to smashes and or eversions with inversion? Isn't a grand and sweeping swap of something and nothing enough for one paradigm shift? 
How precisely could these flippy flappy swirly spheres or their entangling holy hyperbreads build in the math of games? How problematic might it be that we're moving away from the full pies and infinite jazz that e-versions and the standard continua of topological classicality entail? Well, let's remain ever skeptical and keep asking these questions while remembering too that large numbers, which are decidedly not infinite, may just be important keys to the ultimate stability of the universe's tiniest shapes, curiously enough. It's just not obvious how this could all work out with standard classical methods. Games offer some structuring possibilities that classical numbers alone don't. Even the infinite ones and finite tensors that point to unique structures of their own. Yes, I'm saying surreal numbers are quantum numbers, and the standard set theory formulation of the reals are classical numbers, and it gets better. Games are quantum values, not all of them numbers. With this extended composition of our non-passive patients together, we're working our way there. Soon enough, those normed composition algebras will swing back into view. It turns out there are only so many ways to realize them that allow for division. Remember, like the eversion possibilities, reflected in the smashes too. And you'd be right if you suspected that the operation of division sounds important to the concept of partitions we keep playing with such as how we might get these spherical realms of perfection to play nicely into the delightfully dirty applied spaces of finite combinatorial games and their implementation. A smash-up you don't normally hear about, and that's a shame. Alas, so much more to cover, and as this episode grew very long indeed, to hear the rest, click on part two of the Surreal Preprints podcast for episode two. Who are you calling empty? And I'll see you on the flip side.